So not that long ago, I went to a deli and I got myself a Montreal smoked meat sandwich and it was delicious. If you'd never had one, you were missing out. They asked me what I wanted on it for toppings. I said, well, obviously some mustard and then throw on some jalapenos and maybe a few cucumbers. And then they asked me, do I want it toasted? Well, of course I want it toasted. So they put it in the toaster and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And while I waited, and you know this is true, I thought about chemistry. Now you might be wondering, how do I get from a sandwich to chemistry? And the answer is reaction mechanisms. And what we're going to do is we're going to start out with the reaction mechanism for a sandwich or the sandwich mechanism. So what you do is you take a piece of bread and you put some butter on it and you set that aside and that is now the bottom. And then you take another piece of bread and you put some mustard on it and you set that aside as the top, the top, because I'm not a psychopath. And then you take that bottom, bring it back, and then you add the meat on top of that. That is now the middle of the sandwich. And then what you do is take that top that you made earlier, you stick that on top of the bottom, uh, on top of the middle, and that is your sandwich. Now you might not think of it that way, but if I take that bottom, well, I ended up using the bottom, so there's no bottom anymore. And then the top got used up in making the sandwich, and also the middle got used up. So by the time I'm done, my overall steps shows me the recipe because I've gotten rid of all my sandwich intermediates and I now have my full sandwich, my full reaction for the sandwich, which is two breads, butter, mustard, meat, and making a sandwich. Now I had to do it in all those individual steps and you, if you've never made a sandwich before, you should try that. But if I relate that to chemistry, the reality is very few reactions happen in a single step. We often write them as a complete single line reaction, but rarely do they actually happen in a single line. They're going to happen in multiple steps. If I take this reaction, for example, methane plus two oxygens producing carbon dioxide and two waters, it is not going to happen in a single step. There's just too many things that would have to happen, too many bonds that would have to break, and too many bonds that would have to form. Not going to happen all at once. It's going to happen in multiple steps. And we call those little steps elementary steps. And then when we take all those elementary steps combined, we will have our net reaction. And one of the things about the elementary steps is, much like the sandwich, some of the things I produce in earlier steps get used in later steps. And those are called reaction intermediates. There are reactions that take place in a single step, although they are quite rare. I'm going to show you some of the, a couple of them that include their rates, because we've been talking about rate laws. If you have a single molecule that simply breaks down, Okay, unimolecular means single molecule. Decomposition reactions are going to often be like that. The rate for those is almost always the rate law constant times the concentration of that thing. You don't really need to know that because if you need a rate law, I'll give you a rate law. Sometimes there's a reaction that involves two molecules and they will just combine together and do something. Either combine together as a synthesis reaction or combine together in some sort of like this is going to be probably best called a single displacement type reaction. In that case, bimolecular means two molecules, um, and then the rate law is almost always going to look like this, where each concentration has an exponent of one to it. And uh, you can also have it where it's two of the same kinds of things. Think of a chlorine atom with a chlorine atom getting together to form a chlorine molecule. Then the rate in that case would follow uh, that. Now, what I want to point out is even though we've been saying that the rate law has to be experimentally determined, we are going to start talking about rate laws and being able to predict them from reactions. So here you'll notice that the rate laws and the reactions do kind of have a familiar feel to them or a similarity to them is maybe a better way to put it. Let's talk about elementary steps. So an elementary step is at that molecular level, which we don't normally see, what is actually going on, which bonds are breaking at any one instant, which new bonds are being formed at any one instant. And what we're going to be doing is focusing on one or sometimes two molecules. Very, very rarely will it be three molecules colliding all at the same time, but we can work with two molecules colliding at the same time. And we're also going to be looking at coming up with a list of reactions. We're not going to have to worry about coming up with five or six or seven, but two or three is pretty reasonable in order for us to come up with a proposed mechanism. It also is needs to be understood that it is going to represent a best guess, but 
We'll get there. The rate of the overall reaction is going to be dictated by the slowest step in the same way that no matter how fast that guy could have made the sandwich, the part that made me wait was the toaster because that's the thing that took the time. So same thing with a reaction, no matter how fast everything else is, the slowest overall step in the, in the sequence is going to be the step that di dictates the rate for everything. And that is called the rate determining step. Now, when you look at the rate law that you measure, that you can't predict from the original reaction, if you look at the rate law, it will actually look familiar or it will look a lot like the rate determining step. So I can't do a rate law from the overall reaction, but if I have the reaction, the sequence of elementary steps that make up the overall mechanism, then I can say, hey, reaction mechanism, this elementary step looks like the rate law. So reaction mechanism, as I mentioned before, is a sequence of reactions, sequence of elementary steps where everything represents is either one or two things colliding. And it is really understood to be a educated guess. There's a couple things that can help us make a better guess, but it is just an educated guess because we're suggesting products, intermediates for example, that we don't know for sure. We can't actually see what's going on, so we're making guesses about what's going on. So how do we make a good guess? Well, each step is going to have one or two, very, very rarely, three particles colliding together. For us, never three, don't do the three, but one or two. And then the rate determining step should look a lot like the rate law, and I'll show you what that, I mean by that in a minute. And the other thing is uh, work toward your target reaction. So in here, my overall reaction is this, two nitrogen dioxides reacting with one fluorine to produce two of those. Um, it is not going to happen so that all three of those things combine all at once or collide all at once just right and we get our final products. So we have a reaction mechanism. The proposal is this, that a nitrogen dioxide collides with a fluorine. Could it have been something else? There's not really a lot, uh, many other options, right? So, and then it produces these things. Could I produce something else? Sure, but I'm trying to get to the products. So the products are the NO2F. So if I can produce one of those, I'm off to the races. Well, what else did I produce? Well, whatever else I've got left over, which is a fluorine atom. So now I have to use that fluorine atom. I also have two nitrogen dioxides in the reactants and two NO2Fs as a product. So I still have to get the rest of those. So my next step I'm suggesting is going to be the other one reacting with that F atom that I produced because I don't want that and producing the other product. So then I can cancel out my reaction intermediates, add them all up, and I get my overall reaction, the sum of the elementary steps, and I get that to be my net overall reaction. That's all there is to it. Okay, now going back one more step or adding one more step, I should say, if I look at the rate law for that reaction as I know that reaction to be or as I know the rate law to be, I get this. Now what that means is that the rate determining step, the slow step, involves those two particles, one of each, because my exponents are one each, so that means my reaction is going to be one of each. And then that step is the step that dictates or determines the rate, so it's like the rate determining step, said other words. So I go back and I look for those two things, one of each combining together, and I label that as a slow step. Everything else is going to be fast, or at least faster, because the thing that slows down the reaction is that step. All right, let's look at an example start to finish. I'm going to give you the reaction. Here it is. And I'm going to propose a sort of observe a rate law and then we're going to come up with a rate determining step uh, sorry we're going to come up with the yeah identify the rate determining step and come up with a mechanism but here is the rate law okay you come up with or we're going to come up with the reaction mechanism now I'm actually going to start with the rate law using it to form my rate determining step so what that means the rate law is given as NO2 to the exponent 2 that there's likely two molecules of NO2 combining together Okay, so what I'm going to do with that is start out with combining two of those molecules together. Now, what can I get out of that? 
I've got lots of options. It doesn't have to be this. I can think of at least one other option that I could have, but again, I'm trying to get to my overall net reaction. So if I can get partway there, then that's even better. So then what I do is I bring in the rest of the stuff. Maybe it takes me two more lines to do it. Maybe it takes me one more line. In this case, one more will do it. And I bring in the other stuff that I need, also trying to consume or get rid of any intermediates that I produced in the meantime. So get rid of the intermediates and then um, cancel out one on the left and one on the right and add them all up and away I go. Okay. Now I can also identify which one was fast, which one was slow. I know which one is slow because it was my starting point. It was how I got my first step was because I started with the rate law and I knew that to reflect the uh, one of the steps and the rate determining step. Let's look at another one. Uh, if we take this reaction okay, and uh, from it you are given a rate law and you'll notice the rate law is simpler, right? it doesn't have that exponent to it. And then I'm also going to propose a reaction mechanism and ask you to identify the rate determining step. So again, the rate determining step and the rate law have some familiarity to them, so you're going to be using one to help you identify the other, which means the first step is the slow step. Second step is therefore faster. Now that generates a couple of questions. One of the questions is, is it always two steps? Because the examples we had were, and the answer is no. I can have multiple steps. I'm not gonna give you a lot of multiple step questions because why would we? We don't need to do that. But in here, we've got a multiple step reaction. If you're not really sure how uh, those things were proposed, or if you're wondering, could I do something else? The answer is always, yes, you could do something else. And um, why those? no re real reason. Now if I had an overall net reaction as a starting point, then coming up with the proposing a mechanism rather is makes much much more sense, but it, whatever. Is that always going to be the slow step as the first step? And the answer to that is no. However, putting the slow step somewhere else or having the slow step somewhere else does generate a bit of a problem because if the slow step in the actual mechanism contains reaction intermediates, it's a little bit tricky because if I look at this one, for example, where the rate determining step is in the middle, if you look, sorry, in the middle at the end, second step, if you look at that, if you were to come up with the rate law based on this, you'd have a problem because one of the things in that slow step is a best guess. It's you don't know for sure if that stuff is exists. You can't measure the concentration of that. So if you were to look at the actual rate law, here you'll notice that the rate law basically combines the first step and the second step because the only way to get to the second step, slow step, is to have that first step. Now again, I'm not going to ask you to be predicting stuff like that, but you need to understand that it's not just as simple as, oh, slow step equals rate law because of, of the intermediate in there. Okay, I know there's a lot going on here and we're gonna get some practice at it, but also understand that for a lot of it, we just need to understand the basics of, of this stuff. So you should be able to suggest a reasonable mechanism given a reaction. You should be able to identify the rate law based on the rate determining step, and you should be able to identify the rate determining step from the rate law. And after that, we'll just get some practice at it and we'll see you another time.